uh, live right there in southeast Illinois, uh, cl really close to the uh, Agrigold headquarters, if you know where St. Francisville is. Um, they were some of the first to plant Agrigold soybeans three years ago, uh, right there uh, close to the, uh, the old Aiken uh, farmstead itself. So what we're going to do is these guys are going to kind of tell their story about how they've uh, achieved uh, 100 plus bushel uh, soybean yields. And they're going to kind of ask the question, is this the norm uh, that we're getting ready to see for the next several years? They're going to kind of give us some insights about how they've done that. So maybe 15, 20 minutes of presentation, and these guys will be right here to answer any questions you want. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Greg McClure. Here you go, Greg. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, first of all, I just want to make sure everybody recognizes that's my son, Cameron, and he's the one who makes it all happen, okay? He's the backbone of the business, all right? And, there's, of course, there's got to be one guy in the crowd who, here today who <clears throat> is a wise guy who's well over 100 bushels, so thanks a lot, Jimmy, for being here. Uh, anyway, this picture here was taken the day that we harvested our beans. I just wanted to show you that's the plant at Agrigold. That's the home-based plant, so... But I want to get back and uh, want you to think about a, a couple of things. I always, uh, first thing, I, I, anytime I go to a meeting, I always want to go home with one take-home message, okay? So if you don't remember anything else, I'm going to give you the take-home right away. Chris Cooper asked me if, two or three weeks ago if I would speak, and I said, what about? He says, well, basically just do the same presentation you've been doing. I said, okay, that's great, I could do that. And then I get something in the mail and it says, can 100 bushel soybeans be the norm? I live in a county of where 50 is the norm, and he puts up 100. So the first take-home message is, if they ever ask you to speak, make sure you title, send them the title of your presentation. Don't let them do it, because I would have said, like, can 60 be the norm, okay? I want to roll back a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, one of my best friends, he's the CEO of the of a, a billion dollar a year in sales pork company, okay? A billion a year. And he was over in China. He went on a three week trip to see about them starting to put hogs into China. When he gets back and he lands, he calls me and I said, well, what's the take home message, the one take home message? And I'm thinking he's gonna tell us something about hogs because we raise hogs. He says, figure out how to grow soybeans. I said, what? I thought you were going to tell me something about hogs. He says, no. He says, you need to figure out how to convert every acre to soybeans. But you got to remember, at that time, we're planting 60 to 70% corn. Right? Corn's $5, $6, whatever that it is. We see genetics changing all over. We see yields increasing on corn. And what are bean yields doing at that time? Basically a flat line, right? And he says, you got you got to raise beans. He says, because he says, we traveled for three weeks, and I never saw one bean field in China all corn. I said, why no beans? He says, because of transportation costs. Okay, and I thought, okay, but corn is still, corn is king, three or four years ago. So then we start to roll forward, and we start to, all of a sudden, I got to thinking about some things. And do you realize that, that a population today in the U.S., I mean, in the world today, is growing by over 200,000 people per day. Over 200,000. Just the population growth alone would totally repopulate the U.S. in four years. Not the number of babies being born, but just in growth. In four years, we'd totally repopulate the U.S. So the demand for protein is probably not going away anytime soon. So let me ask you. So then I had to start figuring out, well, what's a, what, what's a bean worth? What is that bean? What's a three bean pod worth? I mean, what does that mean to us monetarily? What is one three bean pod? Right? So I think the average person in America today, let's say they plant 120,000 for their population. A three bean pod, that gets you 360,000 seeds. Let's say it's a small bean at 3,000 seeds per pound, divide that by 60 pounds per bushel, and we get two bushels per acre for one pot. So what does that make that two bushels worth? $10 beans, maybe we're not there now, maybe we got a little help to get there this year. The $10 beans times two bushels, 
That's an additional $20,000 for every 1,000 acres of beans that you plant. And I start thinking, well, that's, that is serious and significant dollars. I only know of three ways to increase yield. One is maybe by heavier seeds, right? And I don't know that I, have, I haven't figured out a way to do that yet. Maybe we can with some late additions of sugars or carbons. Maybe there's some things that we can do to increase the test weight. But when an average bean weighs five one thousandths of an ounce, even a little bit's going to make a huge difference on yield. Number two would be to increase the number of seeds per pod. I will tell you that in, in 2017, we averaged a little over 2.7 beans per pod. In 2018, a little over 2.8. But I don't think earlier planting, I don't think will make a difference. I think this had more to do with the heat and the weather than, it, than anything else on how we increase the number of seeds per pot. The only way I really know for sure how to increase yield is to increase the quantity of pods. So how do we do that? Number one is, as we've all heard this for the last few years, plant early, plant early, right? So I said, I said well, I'm going to count here that averages 50 bushel to the acre. In 2016, we decided we ought, we'd try some planting early. We only had one planter, we had a break, didn't have some corn to plant, switched things around, planted some beans. Guess what? We had 72 bushel. That was the best beans we'd ever raised in that county, 72 bushels in 2016. But we planted early. We planted like the second week of April. So I thought, okay, for 17, we gotta do something different here. And we went out and we got a second planter. So in 17, we went to the field first to plant beans, not second. Not behind corn, but before corn. In 17, we had over 100 bushel dry land and over 100 bushel irrigated both. So we got really excited for 18. We decided to push the, push the envelope. In 18, we planted, the first day we planted beans, we planted, the air temperature was 32, the soil temperature was 42. And I tell you what, we didn't do it on the main road, we did it on the back road, as far away, because all of our neighbors, you knew what they were going to say, right? So we did it down a dead-end lane. That was the best beans we'd ever raised on that farm by over 20 bushel. Now, I'm not saying to go plant all your beans when then, but my point of it is, what I want you to understand was in 18, we really learned something. We had two nine beans, maturity, three five and four twos, but all three, planted on a similar time. But that year, but we had everything plugged into our climate, right on, we had everything in the computer, it was all being tracked for GDUs. I'd never looked at GDUs on soybeans before. What we discovered in 18 was that, whether it was a 2.9 or a 3.5 or a 4.2, somewhere between 750 and 800 GDUs, those beans started to flower. So what's the important point of that? The really important part of that is, is to understand that soybeans are not just photo dependent. But there's a heat accumulation factor that applies. And what we need to do is we need to get through the vegetative state as quickly as we can to get the reproductive state. Right? So the earlier that we plant, the quicker we can get those beans to, to accumulate those GDUs so we can start into the reproductive stage. The longer we can stay in that reproductive stage, the more chance we have of adding more nodes. And if we can add more nodes, hopefully we can add more pods. So I think that's a really important take home message is on these bean maturities is to understand why that early planting, yes, I know we want to capture all the sunlight and all the energy that we can, but it's really important also to get through that vegetative growth stage and into the reproductive stage. The main thing I want to talk about today, though, is something a little bit different and a little and a little that maybe people haven't talked about so much, and that's seed spacing. I think that might be the one critical piece that everybody that we're really missing with soybeans. In 17, we started to under, we started to look at these beans, not just walking out in them as they were growing and they got taller, but we started looking, we started getting down on the ground and underneath the canopy, and we started looking at these plants, and we started seeing these plants that. Maybe two of them were close together. Maybe they were an inch apart and they had maybe 30 or 40 pods on them. Then we'd see one that was maybe three inches apart and it might have 120 pods on it. And we started to understand that this one that had a little more space around it 
It actually had more pods than the two beans did that were next to each other. So what I'll tell you is, I think today, I'm not too sure. I mean, we've all known for years now, we've talked about it, how important spacing, the accuracy of spacing is on corn. It might even be more critical on beans than it is on corn. Okay, because when we talk about a 20 or 30 percent maybe variation in spacing on corn, imagine what that is on beans, 20 to 30 percent. So is it maybe even a larger impact yet? And I think the question is, is seed spacing, it's not row spacing. A lot of people ask us, well, what about row spacing? Which row, should we be on 15s or should we be on 30s? I don't know the answer to that for sure. But I think the question is seed spacing has to come first because we've never ever been able to compare a 15 inch row bean to a 30 inch row bean. And you say, well, wait a minute, now how can that be? And I'm telling you, I don't believe that we've ever been able to compare. The reason being is because I don't think the equipment has allowed you to plant a 30 inch row bean with the accuracy of a 15 inch row bean. Okay? Think about that for a minute. Like we had, a, we planted beans in 15s and 30s. Planted them, and on the the, the 15 inch row beans, we have a hundred seed disc in there. And so when it makes one revolution, it's going to drop a hundred beans. And it's on 15 inch rows, so it's only going to be turning at half the speed for the same population as a 30 inch row bean. Now look at a 15 inch row planter. We have the precision, we have the V-set meters, but that in 2018, we had the double disc with the double knocker on it. And that thing is spinning so much faster now, it's a smaller disc, we could never get seat spacing to be accurate. But what we wanted to do, no matter what speed we tried, we couldn't get there. So we're gonna make some more changes in, eight, in 18. But like in 17, I think you guys you need to be out you need to be looking at your seed space. You need to be measuring it, seeing where it's at when you're putting it in the ground. I think when it comes up, you need to see, do you have it coming up? Just like all those things you're worried about with corn, worry about all those same things with soybeans. And I think that, I call those almost like free bushels. Okay? Obviously, here's some things you hear everywhere. I think in 2019, I think a fungicide treatment on your beans is going to be more important even than it was in 17 and 18 because of all, the, all of the diseases that we had in 18, I think that's why you're gonna need that fungicide to increase your germ rate. But a lot of these things, I think there's a lot of people in this room a lot smarter than me who can answer those questions, like Mike Cavanaugh, to talk about putting fungicides, insecticides, maybe something for some SDS, an inoculant, and a biological to help with germination and root growth to get the season started off correctly. And remember with soybeans, I just want you to see that, you know, when you look at them, don't forget to look over them and realize that they don't grow into each other, right, do they? They grow outward. So I don't know whether 15s or 30s are, is better, but I do know this. We'd never planted 30s before. We planted 30s and 15s, and we did all the same treatment on both. I did not realize that a 15 inch row will close before, I mean a 30 inch row will close before a 15. And I guarantee you when you're taking tissue tests, it's a whole lot harder to walk down a 30 inch row than it is a 15. Now why is that? Well, we raise a lot of hogs. So I think when we talk about stocking density in livestock, same, same thing is attributed to your plant. When we've got a 30 inch gap, we've got room for that plant to reach out and to grow, right? It's going to reach out and grow to the sunlight. When we get a 15, it's going to want to do more of this. Maybe we can get that plant, the more spacing we have around it, we can get it to develop more branches, more laterals, thus increasing yield. Sorry. I think this is what we're looking for early on. I mean, we're looking for these branches, these laterals to develop, because you can almost tell when you move into a field with the combine, if those things, if they, if you don't see a bunch of laterals sticking out, you probably, the yield's not gonna be there. It's not gonna be what you want it to be. You can, you can just tell where the, the best spots are in the field, just by the number of laterals. 
I'm looking for help. Anybody who can tell me help me with how to irrigate soybeans. I just wanted to touch. I put this one slide in here for one reason. Is because so far we've only been able to irrigate beans to get three to four bushel better than we are in our dry land right next to it. Because I think there's something about beans, and we need to let these beans. It's okay to let them stress early, and I didn't want them to stress. And I put water on them early, and I probably got them looking too good early, and then they got too big on me. Right. This is, a, I think this is important also as we look at the phenotype of our, of our soybeans. Look how narrow the leaf is on this plant. Two things that are really important about that is, number one, that narrow leaf is going to let sunlight down into the plant, much deeper into the canopy than a big round flat leaf. Okay. We could take this soybean and at full maturity in height, you can walk by it with your cell phone, hold it over in video, walking across it, and you can see the sunlight hitting the bottom leaves in the plant. Okay. The other thing that that allows you to do is, look how much, how much quicker it's going to be to move the nutrients from the edge of the leaf to the main veins of the leaf. Okay, to feed that seed later on. Because here we are. We are, uh, we're going into R3 with this soybean, but I wanted to, what I wanted to show you was, with that narrow leaf, look what's happening down in the bottom of the canopy. New laterals at R3, down in the bottom of the canopy, because we're getting some sunlight down in there, we're feeding that plant, and what did we say, what is one bushel, if I could just pick up one more bushel per acre, because I could get one more three bean pot down there, $20,000 for every the soybeans the way I planted. So when we got to early August, we start seeing a lot of beans like this. In this case, we've got one with three laterals on it, uh, over 150 pods, still blooming heavy in the top. We were pretty excited because we thought we were going to reach our goals. We wanted to be somewhere in that 125 minimum up to, up to 140 bushel. We had the beans, they were there. Then Mother Nature hit. August 15th, we got a four inch rain in 20 minutes, beat them down on the ground. End of set, beginning of September, we caught a nine inch rain from the hurricane that came up through the remnants of the Hurricane Gordon, I think it was, or whatever name it was. Whatever, I don't want any grandchildren named after it, I know that. But once again, this, this just put these beans into, into shock. They didn't, we couldn't get them to develop properly. And we lost all of our sunlight down into the canopy and, and we didn't end quite as strong as that we wanted to. But I wanted to share some other things with you real quick. When you're tissue testing, I think this is, remember this slide. I don't know what's gonna happen in 19 and I don't know what the, all the major companies that are doing your tissue testing are gonna tell you. But this is one of the largest ones in the U.S. We started sending in all of our tissue samples the last couple of years. And I'm kind of a numbers geek, and I wanted to, I wanted to record and restore all, and store all this so I knew where I needed to be. What did they say? Were we sufficient? Were we deficient? What were we? Notice, I started seeing the same numbers, I thought. And I, pretty soon I started recording all of this at each stage, growth stage. And look, they only have a recommendation for vegetative. It's all the same and reproductive is all the same. So, yes, you need to tissue test. Yes, you need to know what the results are. You need to build that database so you know for the future, but you can't take the sufficient, deficient, average. Just know what you're looking at. Get with people who can help you understand what it is that you've got. Also, when it comes to 100 plus bushel beans, maybe 150 bushel beans, maybe it's easier to raise 150 bushel beans than it is going to be to harvest them. When you're talking about green stems the size of your thumb, trying to cut them and trying to get them through there without grinding up your beans can be a real challenge. That's what the ground looked like when we were done. Well, these beans should have been cut in September, second week of September at the latest, because of all the heavy rainfall, they wouldn't mature, 
it's finally on October 3rd. They were calling for heavy rain on October 4th again, so we just we had to go cut them and get what we could. Main thing I wanted to tell you today was the best time to change your yield is at planting. It's not later. It's not trying to recover something or fix something. The best time to change your yield is at planting. Having the right genetics, the right seed treatments, your planting date, and maybe as important as any of them is your seed spacing. So I was watching a movie called Molly's Game the other night, and toward the end of the movie she says, Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill describes success as the ability to move from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And I thought, wow, doesn't that apply to farming and to trying to chase higher yields, doesn't it? Because you've got to still be enthusiastic about it, even after your failure, after failure, after failure, trying something new. In fact, this picture right here, this is the background of our field where those beans were harvested from. That's the picture from April when we should have been planting. That's what the field looked like. It looked almost like that again in June, almost like that again in September. And there was even more water than that in when we left the house a few days ago on that ground. So when Chris Cooper titled, entitled this presentation, our 100 bushels, can we make them the new norm? I want to leave you with just a couple of thoughts. Harvest population. Look, this is to create 100 bushel beans at 2.8 beans per pot and 2,800 seeds per pound. We're only looking at 60 pods on a plant at 100,000. 60 pods would get you 100 bushel beans. Now, that's going to put them, here's your spacing. Okay, what that would be on 15 and 30 inch rows. What about at 60,000? Look how far apart we're getting these beans spread apart. But we got to have, we got to get them up, we got to get them planted accurately, and we got to get establish a stand. That's why that planting time is when you're going to impact your yield more than any other time of the year. One last slide I wanted to show you was my friend Chris Master sent me this picture a few weeks ago. This is a bean plant from in Missouri. 1,440 pods on one plant. So have we really even started to tap into the genetic potential of soybeans? I don't really believe that we have. But I don't know how to do this yet. And I don't know that anybody else knows how to duplicate or replicate it, but it's possible. Right there it is. So what's the potential? Think about that for a minute. We talk about 100 bushel beans. Do you know if, you could have, if we can create plants like that, how far apart we'd have them spaced in your field? 100 bushel beans. That bean plant has 1.3 pounds of seed in it. It takes 4,167 of those on an acre to have 100 bushel beans. You know how far apart that is on, on 15 inch rows? That's over eight foot between bean plants, right? On 30 inch rows, it's over four feet between plants. So what if we could create one of those every two feet? It's 200 bushel beans. So I love the question is, that Chris challenged us with, can 100 bushels be the new norm? I think it'll be there quicker than what we realize because I think we're just now starting to understand we spent a lot of years studying corn and not so much studying soybeans. But I think those days are the, those days are upon us now and I don't think it'll be that long before somebody breaks the record. We're gonna, somebody's gonna break 200, I, I predict here sometime in the next two, three years. I believe somebody's gonna hit, break 200. So, anyway, thank you everybody, thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope maybe you learned something. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Greg. Appreciate those insights. Does anybody have any questions for Greg? What population did we plant at? These, our beans were planted at, on 30 inch rows, we planted about 115,000 this last year. We got a final stand of 97,000. In our 15 inch rows, we were at 125. We're going to experiment with some lower pops definitely in 2019, but that's where we were at in 18. Okay, with that, 
I think that concludes our session. I sure want to thank Greg McClure again and Cameron for uh, joining us here at this AgriGold session. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. Let us know if you need anything.